Hi, everyone. This is Jen Grisanti, and this is my story therapy interview with one of my favorite guest speakers uh, of my StoryWise events, Dan O'Shannon. Welcome, Dan. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm excited to be here, Jen. Thanks. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dan, and then you can fill in anything you would like to fill in. Dan O'Shannon is an American television writer and producer and has worked on such shows as New Heart, Cheers, and Frasier. Uh, he was an executive producer of the Emmy show Modern Family, but left the show at the conclusion of season five to accept a development deal at CBS TV studios, not to mention you've won a gazillion Emmys, uh, the Golden Globes, like all, all that other stuff. So is there anything in, in there? Is it fascinating for you to like look at your body of work and reflect on how you got where you are? Well, as time passes, it feels a little more to me like how I got where I was. You know, time doesn't stand still. And uh, the last big thing I did was modern. I did some other stuff too, and some stuff I'm very happy with. The Modern Family was the big last thing I did. And now my time on it was like 10, oh, about uh, eight years ago, I guess I left that show. And it goes into the past rather quickly. And that's one thing that uh, perhaps any piece of advice is like, don't invest too much of your own identity into your career or what you've accomplished, because at some point, it might stop and you have to know who you are moving forward after that and be okay with it. And I feel, you know, I remember uh, when I first started speaking to college kids, I would tell them about Cheers and they all knew Cheers. And now no one in college was alive when Cheers was in prime time. Half of them, they were all infants when Frazier was on prime time. And that happened so quickly that you, you know, you, you have to just recognize that, uh, you know, you have your time and it's great. And then, you know, this sounds really depressing, actually. No, no. You Leave know it. what? It's excellent advice, Dan. I love that you actually tapped into that because I remember when I, it took me 13 years to become vice president of current programming. And I remember that um, uh, an executive, my boss at the studio above me, when he was showing me my office, he said, recognize that you were, this is going to be filled with flowers and you are going to have friends who are your real friends versus friends who are friends with you because of the chair you're seated in. And yeah. I remember thinking when he said that, I remember thinking, God, that sounds so cynical. But I think when you go through it, you, you recognize things like, all right, yes, I'm in the office. Yes, it took me 13 years to get here. Yes, this is temporary. And there will be a bazillion people here after me. And there were a bazillion people here before me. And, and so be in the moment when it's here. So I actually look at that now in a very optimistic way. So I love that you tapped into the idea of be present when your career is happening, but don't let it define you totally because right. there's so much more. No, right. I, I mean, I enjoyed every bit of it while I was going on. I mean, besides the stress and whatever, but I was aware and very grateful for every moment and every good show that I worked on, every opportunity. I had to add something to the vocabulary of TV or storytelling a little bit. And um, but I but I I never fooled myself into thinking, well, you know, hundreds of years from now, people will be looking at this. No, we all have our days. You know, people wrote for mm -hmm. amazing shows on radio. You know, we don't remember the people who wrote Jack Benny and, and Fred Allen and all these other people who came and everyone who's watching these go, who, by the way, look them up, look them up. They were amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, we are of our time. We make the people who live around our time laugh or think or cry or feel or give them new ways to look at things. And that's really the best we can do. And if things last beyond us, even a day, aren't we lucky? You know, I, I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's great. Uh, okay, so question wise, yes. I'm always I know, I'm fascinated because I know you with your book took such a deep dive into looking at humor. So when you think of humor with your writing, um, was there an aha moment when you were writing where humor just started working? Like you got it, you understood it, and it was, you know, this aha 
of, wow, this, this joke is working and I know how to do this. Well, that started to happen uh, more or less, I don't say instinctively, but, but close to instinctively uh, as I started doing stand up. I mean, when I was a kid, I tried to be funny all the time and I did not know how to be funny. And I tried every, I imitated a million different things as a kid would, you know? And it wasn't until I was about 17, 18, 19 that I, I really started to be what I always call reliably funny, where I could kind of come up with a good joke and enough so that I could do stand up. And that began the education because I found by watching other people and also by experimentation, you know, with audiences, I found ways to deliver jokes. I found out that the, the messenger was just as important as the message, if not more so. You know, I found out that the, the, the material is not your act. The material is like the blueprint. You're, you're building the structure on the stage and that is the act. You know? And I learned lots of things. And I sort of, as I learned each step and as I went from just trying to be funny to, to really realizing you could tap into every emotion, you know, I began to uh, then sort of deconstruct what I was sort of learning, go, well, why does this happen? How does this happen? How, how can this happen consistently? What are the reasons that it can't always happen every single time? You know, why do jokes get old? Why, you know, on and on. And I ended up writing a book about it, but it was really, I studied it, studied it, got somewhat, I don't want to say facile, but able to do it. And then went back and sort of reliving how I got from point A to point B to point C, was able to deconstruct and then analyze it. And, and so, uh, but there wasn't one aha moment. There were a number of little breakthroughs, you know, like going from writing just funny to writing characters that had emotions. Uh, and when I realized that, that like, for example, I, I think I was at Cheers when my, my writing started to grow up. And- uh, and I love and, that. And it that's my true. writing started to grow up. That's oh, great. my writing was my writing was just a a uh, probably obnoxiously silly teenager at that point, and then it had to grow up at some point. And I what I began to realize this was through my own therapy too. I realized that my behavior was not, and nobody's behavior is, you know, exactly uh, 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 indicative of what's going on inside of them. If I'm upset about X, I might be upset about X, but I might easily be upset because of something that happened thirty years ago you know, that's being triggered by that. And, and you start to realize there's a whole subtext, your, your inner child is subtext, your past experiences, your wounds, whatever, that's all subtext that colors how you act now. So how you act now is a combination of how you're reacting to the present and how you're re-reacting as a child, okay? And it occurred to me that all the characters I was writing, you know, Norm and Cliff and Sam and Cheers, they weren't trying to be funny. They didn't know they were on TV. They, you know, sometimes, yeah, they're trying to be funny. They're putting each other down and making jokes. But for the most part, they believe in the things they believe in. They want what they want. They're afraid of what they're afraid of. They, they're, you know, they have all the regular human foibles that everyone has. And that jokes are fun to write, but jokes are often, they could be used as windows as well to what's happening on the inside. And their behavior, the character's behavior began, began to, in my mind, resemble more about what human beings do. And I didn't sacrifice any of the funny, but it sort of just, just filled everything with this uh, much deeper way of human behavior that I could, I could write. I love it. I know in this course, we're heavily going into the idea of tran transformation that happens for the character, diving into the childhood wound, the earlier wound, the flaw, the negative narrative, all having to do with the idea of the inner child. And, right. and what gets triggered. Yeah. And it's, you know, the trick is I always find this, I think you and I, we, we always, we sort of talk around this a lot. I always yeah. find, you know, the, the trick, is, once you've learned that, and once you know that characters operate that, you get to a point where you write it without saying it and you write their behavior so that the audience sort of knows that without having to have the character mm -hmm. say, well, I'm, of course I'm upset about this. Cause when I was 10, I really wanted a bicycle and blah, blah, blah. You know, you get to the point where you understand that. And the way the character acts kind of almost subconsciously imports that into the minds of the viewer, you know? And so I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, trying to, trying to, and with everything, it's always, you learn to write it, then you learn to say it without writing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's to me, even the, the, the sort of longer term goal, but first master how to write it, of course, mm -hmm. you know, I think. Well, and the idea of less is more, and I agree with you, not hitting it on the nose and right. feeling it through choice and action. 
right. so that we, we, with our own worldview, the viewer mm -hmm. can attach what, what we feel to it. So, right, exactly. so yeah, I love that. I think that's great. So when you look at the new generation of writers wanting to be comedy writers, if you were to look back at the beginning of your career and talk to your younger self and tell you, if you want a career in comedy, these are the things you should do at the start, what would you say? Um, well, it, you know, I think that, uh, um, Oh gosh, what would I say? Why well, I, I turned it, turn, it turned out okay, so I don't want to screw myself, my past self, up by giving him advice, and then he does something <laughs> wrong, and I'm not here anymore. You created a horrible paradox. Um, <laughs> what if I could go back and I give myself that advice, and then something happens, and now I'm working in a McDonald's? Thanks a lot, Jen. Um, um, but uh, I think that uh, you know all the stuff that happened to me is stuff I would just have told myself a little bit earlier. I would I when I would have said things like. You know, when you're in the writer's room, don't try to be the funny clown. Just, just learn. Just, just do what you're going to do. And sometimes you're going to fail. You know, don't argue for things. Don't, you know, fight for things. Just, just be quiet and you know, do what you're going to do. Um, but uh, all the things like I'm telling you that I learned, I've actually seen now writers in their early 20s that are turning in scripts where they're really thinking about the psychology of the character. Now, when I came up in the ranks, we didn't do that as much. If you look at shows like in the 70s and 80s, you know, some did, some always did. But for the most part, if you're writing The Odd Couple back then, Felix was neat, Oscar was messy. That's all you needed. Mm -hmm. When I worked on the reboot of The Odd Couple about 10 years ago, we were in a room going, okay, so why does Felix need to be neat? What is it that he's lacking control in his, we all talk like little therapists. Mm -hmm. And I remember the transition when rooms didn't do that. You know, occasionally we did. But when now it's like, that's all we talk about is everyone's internal life, you know? Um, so, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I tell students now, yeah, I would have told myself, I wish someone had told me, you know, things like um, if you're studying comedy, you know, some people say, you know, should I watch all the comedies? And I always say, no, you know, watch everything, read everything. Because if you watch and read all the comedies, yeah, you'll learn comedy, but you're not going to add to the vocabulary. You're going to just repeat comedy things. But I mean, you can find that things you read that have nothing to do with comedy, things you experience that have nothing to do with comedy, you could shoehorn it into comedy and you've got something new. I've stolen ideas from, from uh, sci-fi, Japanese dramas and you know manga, whatever, and I put them into sitcoms and it's kind of like this new kind of breath that happens. So take in everything. And part and parcel with that, if you are studying comedy by watching or any art by experiencing the art, don't just study the thing that is in front of you as though it is apart from you, because art is a collaboration between the piece that's being presented and you. Something is happening inside of you, something that you want to be able to synthesize in someone else through your art. So do not just study what is being put in front of you, because that is half of the event that's happening in that moment. You want to study that moment and get really familiar with it and live in it. And you want to experience the art but also one eye is always on what was going on inside of you. How did you feel? And when did you feel it? When did this piece hit you? Was it the music? Was it the little cut they did to the, was it the dialogue? What, what did that to you? Because you're going to use all those tools to do that to other people. So study yourself too. I mean, I've got a, a ton of these things, but, uh, but that, that, that's what I'd say now. That is fantastic. And I, and I think, I think it's so like even knowing you and interviewing you for the last 12, 13 years, like it is fascinating for me to even feel your own growth and talking about writing and, and where a story is evolving. So, I mean, story is evolving since you talked about like when, yes, you did just look at neat versus messy without asking why. And yeah. now it's like so much story. We just watched um, Stillwater with Matt Damon and there was such a massive transformation in this film. And I thought, you know, that's just where story is right now. Like that's, it's what we need. It's what the world needs. Like we yeah. need to understand the why, you know, and right. that, that becomes so important. So if you, with all of your pitches and the amount of pilots and, um, shows you've sold, your pitches in the room when you're on staff. What have you learned about pitching that you are, you tune in on when you hear a pitch? What are you looking for? 
Well, uh, one thing I, I sort of tell people, and I, I'm sure I went through this phase myself, is don't memorize. I mean, yeah, memorize your pitch. Yes, know what you're going to say, but do not become a robot who is now activated the program. Now I pitch the words in the first act. Dot 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 dot. And this happens, and that happens because what happens is you're in a room with someone, you're having a conversation with them. Even if your job is to do all the talking and the selling, by just becoming a reciting machine, you are erasing them from the room. You know, and it's always helpful to engage with whoever you're talking with, you know, in, in every walk of life, in every kind of situation, engage, you're with them, talk to them, because you want to, you want to, to, to reach them the way that you want to reach through this, through the camera and through the TV screen to the people that are watching you, right? And so include them in the conversation a little bit, not every two lines or whatever, but just make sure that when you're talking, you know, you can see when people are reciting because their eyes aren't looking in the room anymore. They're looking at the page that they're remembering that have all their lines in it. You know, this pitch comes from the time when I was a kid and my dad. So, and that's how I got, uh. well, if I'm looking inside my head, I'm not looking at you anymore. So, so just occasionally make mm -hmm. eye contact kind of nod, you know, just, just know that they're there. Also by, if you disappear into your own pitch in that room, you're going to miss signs as to how you're doing. And you need those signs to kind of tell you when to lean this way and when to lean that way. You can kind of get a sense when you're with somebody, if you're telling a story and it's not a high pressure pitch situation, when you're losing them. And when you're losing them, you either skip to the end of the story or you just go back to the part that was more exciting to them and lean on that a little more. You know, you are fluid. You need to be able to be flexible with your pitch. You know, and that comes from being in the room, being with the person with whom you are pitching. You know, maybe that maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's the word we say we pitch to. It's like in a way yeah. it's pitch with. You yes. are both in that meeting, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and so so that's that definitely one thing that that I would I would say. In fact, I just I, did. I think you yeah, I love the idea that you talk about engage, that you talk about eye contact, that you talk about inclusion that you talk about the idea of, you know, just being aware that you're not reciting, you're, you're playing with, you know, yeah. you're, you're wanting people to feel a part of, like, even when we're watching TV, I think the audience wants to feel a part of whether they're, they're guessing where you're going to go and what is going to happen. I feel like there's a similar psychological makeup in the pitch. Right. I think two other things. I hope I remember. I have in my head. I'm sure I'll forget one while I'm saying the other. But um, watch yourself for stilted language in a pitch. Try not to use phrases that only work when you write them, but it's not the way people talk, mm -hmm. you know, because that's another mm -hmm. way that you're distancing yourself when you're reciting a pitch where it's written as though you're saying something as though it's written. Well, that's not a real thing anymore. You know, mm -hmm. um, the other thing is to to I think in a way, you're not really pitching your idea. You're pitching your passion for this idea. You're pitching the potential for what this idea can do when it's out there, you know? And you're, I've, I've gone into meetings where I had nothing, but I so passionately believed in this nothing that I would sell things. I'd walk out the window, uh, the, the, the meeting, jump out the window, you walk out of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have anything, you know, it, it's like, you know, I, but, but, I, but I, in the meeting, I just kicked into gear, you know, it's like, I knew I didn't have anything, but I was, the way I sort of pitched the theme, I had a theme, that's all I had, but I pitched it so in that moment, I fell in love with and believed in that theme as though it was my child and it could do great things if people had just had the chance to see it because we all blah, 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 are practically standing on the furniture. But at the end, it's like, we have to have this show. And inside I'm going, there's no show, you know, but. <laughs> Excellent advice. I love that. that. Is, <laughs> people respond to the, it, it's like I said before about stand up, the jokes, the material, that is not your act. Okay, the act is what happens on that stage with those people, with those people, not to those people. Yeah. The pitch is not something that you've written down and you've learned to say. The pitch is that thing that happens in that room. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Love, love, love this information. So if you were to think of all the shows that you've worked on, what would you say was the funniest show and why do you feel the humor worked? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I have to say, I, 
I don't know that I have, I guess Modern Family, but maybe that's because the, that's the most recent, like really funny show that I worked on. I mean, I worked on mm-hmm. shows that were funny, but that, that one really kind of just knocked it out of the park. It did. Um, I think that uh, one of the things I like about a show like that is that, and Frasier was like this too, is that one week it could be a romantic comedy and the next week it could be a farce and the next week it could be more of a comedy of manners. And then, you know, if it felt like if you have a good enough show with a good enough cast and good enough themes, then the show can kind of be a little flexible in what it is week to week. And then you'll have, it'll have more life. I, uh, I really enjoyed when I worked on shows where I could do things creatively that I hadn't seen before. Um, when I was in the position to experiment, I did some very experimental episodes of Frasier and um, some, well, some things on Modern Family. And um, that to me was a gift. I, I will never have that again. And very few people get to that where you're running a, a national show and everyone just trusts you. I just, no, just trusts you. And, um, and because of that, like when I was at Frasier, I was getting no notes. I could do an episode that was all about this, or I could do an episode that took place in Frasier's mind, you know, essentially. Um, and so I got to experiment with storytelling. And that to me was my favorite part of all of it is when it became, instead of a jo- job, it became this laboratory where I could be a mad story scientist and, and try things and, and make people feel things so unexpectedly. And then you'd be laughing at something and then, oh, suck to the gut, you know, without destroying the actual uh, feel of the show. You know, that's the thing is you don't want the show to be such a hairpin that you think, well, that, that doesn't make sense. You want, you know, how sharp can you make that turn, but still keep everything intact so nothing flies off the screen, you know. Um, but again, it was just a, that I, I don't know that I actually answered your question, but I said a no, lot. No, no, but that's amazing. That, that is, that's amazing training. And the, the fact that you got to have, as you talked about fluidity mm-hmm. with these concepts because of the cast in the show, I, I think that that is, that is great. So I do a lot of work with writers where we talk about the dream and the biggest fear. So looking at your career, knowing that you achieved the dream, you went after it, you made it happen. And looking back at like, what was your biggest fear when you were climbing the comedic ladder? And how did you learn to move through that fear? Um, Well, you know, my dream, I kept my, I don't want to say I kept my dream small because I I grew up on a farm in Ohio and uh, you know, I wanted to get my name on a TV show. I wanted to write something that was good enough so that grownups would actually film it and then other grownups would act in it and say the things that I wrote. And then it would say written by me uh, because I had very low self-esteem. And uh, that was it. It's just like, I just do that. And then I just kept doing it. And, you know, it was really it was just always proving to myself and the people that I was around when I was growing up that I had something worth saying, you know. And that's the thing. Today, everyone has this impulse to write and speak and sit, but half of them, more, 90% of them have nothing to say, you know, and so you're competing against that. Um, my biggest fear, um, I didn't have much fear when I went to Los Angeles because I had nothing to lose. I dropped out of college. I had no job. I had nothing. So I was very lucky. I had nothing to lose. But there was a, a couple times early on when I, you know, was afraid I would never work again, you know, and, and that I think now happens to everyone in every walk of life now. I think careers are more fragmented than they used to be. And there's always those gaps between jobs where you get this kind of like, what if no one hires me anymore? Um, so, I mean, those were always my fears. I, I think like when I was running Frasier, I was terrified that I couldn't deliver the show. I was competing with the history of the show, which was you know critically just a sensation in the first five years. And then I took it over in year eight you know, and so it was, I was now competing with that. And so, yeah, I was, I was up 24 hours a day. It felt like just, just worrying. So mm-hmm. it was that, you know, I think like what everyone worries about, I, I, I sort of hope is that, that what if I'm not good enough, you yeah. know, and, um, you know, uh, and sometimes I rose to it and sometimes I fell down, but I kept going and people seemed all right with it. So, uh, um, but I, I think my fears were pretty, pretty standard issue fears really. Yeah, I think that fear has been explored so much lately as like a core fear of what if I'm not good enough. So I I think that so many people universally connect with that. So I think that's why it's making so many stories lately hit. I mean, we uh, in um, Mayor of Easttown, 
that is the negative narrative that comes from the loss of her father is the feeling that I'm not good enough. And in Ted Lasso, same type of thing. And I think that that is such a a great thing to explore because so many people have to move through that fear and get to the other side of it. Well, do you know, I I have a fear sort of lately and this, uh, I want to say this without sounding immodest and just understand that I'm just totally a human being who who makes a million mistakes a day uh, if I get up early enough. And, um, uh, and that is that uh, I find that since I've, I'm basically, I live back in Ohio now, occasionally I go to Los Angeles, but I'm, you know, Ohio, and I'm working on a documentary here. And I find that I get really nervous when I, cause I'm writing this documentary as well as producing, editing, blah, blah, blah. And when I come up with script pages, I get terrified now when people look at it. And it's not because, you know, I don't think that I'm any good. It's just that I'm aware that I'm competing Everyone here knows, oh, he's got all these Emmys and this Oscar nominee, he blah, 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 you know, big Hollywood, let's just see what he's got. And I feel like the old gunslinger, you know, and the new hotshot comes into town and I'm like, I, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to embarrass myself. You know, I think every time I do a joke that's not that funny, people look at okay, Mr. Hollywood, you know, whatever, you know, I, and, I, and so I feel a, a, a whole new kind of pressure, you know, even though I did it, you know, mm-hmm. I come back here now and I find that you know, they're just people kind of waiting to pounce a little bit, you know, not yes. every, but every now and again, I run into that. And that is actually a fear that's caused because I overcame my fear and became a success. And now I have a new fear. It's just mm-hmm. fears all the way down. Yes. And they ignite <laughs> you and they fuel you. And, and you talked about something that is so true. It's how quickly you get back up and move forward. I mean, it, it for everyone. And I love that you talked about with Frasier, how you competed with the history of the show. And then here you're talking about how you're competing with your own history yeah. and, and in the expectation of the audience. So yeah. that is, oh, thank you so much, Dan. You shared so many gems and the whole purpose of this video is so that writers uh I don't want to say lose their fear because fear ignites them, but come to terms with their fear when they're pitching and recognize who the human being is on the other side of it so that it helps. And as you and I talked about before this interview, you said it's like giving them training wheels because they're not going to have that in the real yeah. world. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and your depth. And one thing I have to say about you that is so good, I think for so many comedy writers to know is you are always so funny like that. I feel like your humor is such a, a natural part of your being. And, and, and so thank you for sharing that with us. Ah, but what's it hiding? That's the stuff you writers have to figure out. (laughs) <laughs> yes, there we go. That's a great note to leave on. Okay, so think about what you are hiding. Thank you so much, ah. Dan. <laughs> I appreciate it. Bye. Let me.